So before Sharp Origins Decipherment in 1822, the hieroglyphs were subjected to different kinds of treatment and interpretation. The task for the neo hieroglyphs in the Renaissance, which is the topic of this lecture, is a fascinating illustration of this. As announced in the program, this lecture will be more or less equally divided between Dimitri and myself. I'll open the show by introducing how the humanists in the Renaissance understood the principles of the hieroglyphic writing. This will set the, set the stage for Dimitri, who will deal with the reception of the hieroglyphic culture and the Prince Bishopric of Liège, with a special focus on the character of Lambert Lombard. I then will discuss an exceptional monument, the funerary monument of Hubert Millemans, who died in 1558 and was buried at the Holy Cross Church in Liège. This monument is exceptional indeed for its two columns of neo hieroglyphs, probably the most elaborate inscription among the compositions that came down to us, except maybe for some literary compositions that never materialized on stone. Between the late antiquity, when the knowledge of hieroglyphs gradually vanished, and the famous discovery of Jean-François Champollion, whose symbolic moment in the letter to Joseph Bondacier, there is a gap of 15 centuries, during which the hieroglyphs were integrated, adapted, transformed to fit a vast array of theories at the intersection of religion, philosophy, linguistics, aesthetics, history, and politics. Basically, this one and a half millennium can be divided in five key moments as shown on the screen. We we'll, shall here only deal with the first two, the reception of hieroglyphs in classical antiquity and the Renaissance, which is characterized by the production of neo hieroglyphs. The Baroque area <clears throat> of the century of Father Athanasius Kircher the age of enlightenment and the process that relate to Champollion's discovery are out of the scope of the present lecture. This lecture is also part of the events around the exhibition actually on display in Liège on the reception of the hieroglyphs before Champollion. The Greek and Romans who had the opportunity to come across the ancient Egyptian culture directly or indirectly were in try sometimes puzzled by the hieroglyphic writing. Between Herodotus, who visited Egypt in the 5th century BC, and the treatise of Oropolo, provided that the hieroglyphic were actually written by the historic Oropolo of the 5th century AD, there is one millennium. During this period, the writing system for the daily life was demotic, which was later replaced by Coptic, around the turn of the 3rd and 4th century AD. Along this, texts were still produced in the so-called traditional Egyptian or Egyptian de tradition and engraved on all possible places in the temples, walls, columns, ceilings, and so on. For those who had the chance of visiting Egypt, best examples of hieroglyphs were probably not the lines and columns of small signs and certainly not small documents written in hieratic or demotic. From what they told us, one realizes that they understood the ancient Egyptian culture as hieroglyphic in a sense. Thus, monumental iconographic compositions were received as symbolic representations and probably explained by the informants as a kind of hieroglyphic writing. It's largely true that the hieroglyphic writing was a laboratory for theologians. By exploiting the potentialities of the writing, they created new concepts and increased thereby the divine theology. The figure now on the screen that stands on the coffin for the 21st dynasty is a condensed way of representing what exists symbolized by the hieroglyphic sign when to be present on the on the divan standard and circled by the uroboros that materialize the limits of both time and space the same process was of course at work 
and the so-called Ptolemaic writing as illustrated by the complex sign of the two deities, Isis and Neftis, attending the small boy in a boat. The elements of the composition provide the necessary phonetic elements to write the name of Osiris. This sign could have very easily been picked up by Orapolo and glossed. When the Egyptians want to write the name of Osiris, they paint a boat with Isis and Nephthys attending the small, boar, the small boy Horus because he was left alone after the murder of his father or something like that. The same spirit operates in the expression Pesachem Achet, shining at the horizon, where the classifier of the last word epitomized the whole expression. Once more, this could have very naturally found its way in later hieroglyphic treaties like Karimos or Horapolos. <clears throat> the reception of the hieroglyphs by the Greek was theorized by philosophers belonging to the school of Plato, whose main figures are Plotinus and Jamblichus in the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. The following extract from the Enneads of Plotinus very nicely captures the function of the hieroglyphs in philosophical terms. This is what the wise man, so say Plotinus, of Egypt realized, it seems to me, whether by exact science or spontaneously. To designate things wisely, they don't use wrong letters, which develop into speech and propositions and which represent sounds and words. They draw instead images, agalmata in Greek, each of which is of a distinct thing. They engrave them in the temples to designate all the details of these things. Each engraved sign is therefore a science, a wisdom, a real thing grasped at once, and not a series of souls like a reasoning or a deliberation. End of quotation. When glossing some hieroglyphs, Jamblichus takes the symbol of Horus sitting on a lotus, which was displayed on different supports, like the smoke lit antique gem now on the screen. And so, said Jamblichus, uh, when he was discussing the, the hieroglyphs, proof of this is the following symbol sitting on a lotus signifies a superiority of the silt, which excludes all contact with it and indicates intellectual root in the Empyrean. Of course, what will deeply influence the Renaissance was the treaty put under the name of Horapolo, a writer from Panopolis in activity in Alexandria around the 5th century. The Hieroglyphica contains 189 notices. We, of course, have no time to discuss this in detail, and I here pick only a very short notice, which says, for representing the idea of opening, they paint a hair because this animal always keeps its eyes open. Indeed, as we know, the sign of the hair is used to write the verb to open in hieroglyphs, but this has nothing to do with the explanation given by Horapolo. Actually, the link to the supposed behavior of the hair of the rabbit is to be found in natural treatises that were popular in antiquity and later during the Middle Ages, like the natural history of Elian and above all, the physiologist. The sign of the hair, which is used to express the phonological pattern wow plus n, is found in different unrelated words like when to be present, when need to hasten, or unut, however, but of course unut is connected to, to huni hasen, but probably not so much uh, still vivid in the conscience of uh, Egyptian speakers. We can see on the back screen how Horapolo's notice was illustrated in the Renaissance, here in the French edition published by Kerver in 1543. Horapolo is actually the last in a series of philosophers who dealt with hieroglyphs. The mode of thinking remains largely identical, as can be seen from this notice by Amianus Marcellinus explaining the meaning of the vulture. Basically, the reasoning is when they want to express X, they paint or write Y because of that. 
This can at least be traced back to Diodorus. And you can see for yourself an example, a virtue mean in this language the word for mother because there is no male in this species according to the rules of nature. After the late antiquity, we make a big jump over the Middle Age, not because there was nothing interesting here, but more simply because it's out of the scope of our present lecture. The Renaissance is a time of the rediscovery of the great text of antiquity. For our purpose, the most important ones are those of Plato, Plotinus, Jamblicus, but also the Corpus Hermeticum, and of course, Rapporos Hieroglyphica, whose main manuscript was rediscovered in 1419. This was also the times when people found their way back to Egypt, even if in a, in a moderate way. Pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem used to land in Saint Jean of Acre, thus bypassing Egypt. But some of them visited Egypt, but their main interest lay in visiting the famous places that are presented in the Bible, like the pyramids, alias Jacob's granaries, or Maria's tree in Matarie, and of course, the monastery of St. Catherine on the Sinai Peninsula. They, however, never went southward beyond the limit of Cairo. It's also the times when Egyptian or Egyptianizing artifacts were rediscovered in Europe, above all in Rome. The most impressive ones are, of course, the obelisk. Even in one has to wait for the end of the 16th century under Pope Sixtus Quintus to have the first one re erected. The small caption at the bottom right gives an idea of the truly pharaonic enterprise it was to carry and re erect this monument, whose greatest one lasted around 400 tons. On the left, you can see a 16th century facsimile of one of the two Nectanibus sphinxes, which never came out of sight during the, middle, during the Middle Ages. The discovery of the famous Mensa Isiaca around 1520 made a very lasting impression. For several decades, it was assigned a very high antiquity and thus supposed to give some clues to the understanding of hieroglyphs. On more philosophical terms, the Renaissance was also the triumph of Neoplatonism, illustrated by some prominent humanists like Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola, who also occasionally dealt with Kabbalah. They took over from the antiquity the theory of the world as an, as an organization of ideas expressed by symbols. And this general theory, the Egyptian culture, and more particularly the hieroglyphic writing played a significant place. You can now see on the screen a passage from Marsilius Ficinos, uh, taken from the publication of its opera Omnia, where he presents the essence of the hieroglyphs, with an example taken from Hora Prolog. And so said Marcel, to express the divine mysteries, the Egyptian priest didn't use individual letter characters but complete figures of plants, trees, or animals, since God obviously has knowledge of things, not so much a multifaceted reflection on the object, but a simple and consistent form on the same. When he draws a winged serpent with its tail in the mouth, the Egyptian integrates all such discourse by a single consistent figure, another thing by similar design as, depict, as depicted by Horus, it was the name uh, at that time for Horopolo. It's important to note one or two points to understand what the humanists had actually in mind when speaking of hieroglyphs. There was no real interest for translating hieroglyphic inscriptions, but the humanists were convinced they had indeed understood the principles of the hieroglyphic writing. And so, there was an emergence of a new original way of writing, which could pass for universal, free from any linguistic realization, and this are the neo hieroglyphs. The starting point for the culture of the neo hieroglyphs 
at the edition of the Hypnerotomachia Polyphily by Francesco Colonna, that is in English, The Strife of the Love in a Dream. During his wanderings, the hero comes across different monuments. On some of them are inscriptions he immediately realizes are hieroglyphic ones, and he very much obliges by giving a translation. You can now see on the screen two of the most representative ones. So the one of the upper left on the screen is translated by Polyphilus, liberal sacrifice your labor to the god of nature. Little by little, you will reduce your spirit to the submission of God, who by his mercy will take care of your life, and by governing it, will keep it safe and sound. And for the inscription at the bottom on the right, to the divine Julius Caesar, always Augustus, governor of all the world, for the clemency and liberality of his courage, the Egyptians erected for me this monument from their common friends. Even those of you who are not very familiar with the, with the Egyptian writings will immediately realize that the signs here have nothing in common with genuine hieroglyphs. That the question is, where does it come from? What kind of repertoire was used by Colonna and those who would come after him? The answer is quite simple. They found their inspiration from Roman artifacts that were largely accessible at that time. Cultic objects that could be seen on monuments of the Forum or very closely nearby, or that were reproduced on coins, provided an easy to use material. But other motifs were used as well, like military trophies or emblem of the dolphin in the anchor that was understood as a hieroglyphic composition for expressing one of Augustus' motto Festina Lente, or Spudi Bradeus in Greek, make haste slowly. Most of these symbols found their way in the Caesarus Hieroglyphical Room compiled by Herwart von Hohenburg in 1610, where the first drawings are totally dedicated to the reproduction in details of the Mensa Isiaca. In the first decade of the 16th century, a certain Filippo Alberici traveled to England with the hope of selling to the nobility and even to the king his neo hieroglyphic compositions, but with apparently no much success. A manuscript by Alberici, now in the British Library, presented itself as a small guide to neo hieroglyphs. It's divided in two parts. The first one, illustrated on the left on the screen, is a list of the neo hieroglyphs with the explanation. The second one, right part on the screen, contains some original compositions made by Alberici with the translation. The signs in the first part are drawn with many details and colors. In the inscriptions, however, the signs are stylized, monochromatic, and calibrated to fit in lines. In the mid 16th century, Piero Valeriano published a compendium entitled Hieroglyphica, like Oropolos, that would become the Bible for all of those interested in the production of symbolic writing. The page in the middle of the screen shows an interpretation of a passage in Ptacus on an inscription that was supposed to be engraved in the Temple of Sais. The inscription, according to Plutarchus, it's a divine warning. The sentence is written with the signs of a young man, an old man, a vulture, a fish, and a hippopotamus. It can be a crocodile in other versions. The whole composition means, from childhood to old age, God harbors impudence. Valeriano made of this a personal inscription engraved on an obelisk with figures that they have nothing in common even very remotely with hieroglyphs. Painters and artists in general were frequently tempted to have their own inscriptions on the buildings. A good example thereof is a painting by Joachim Böckelaar in 1565, whose inscription was interpreted 
some time ago par Charles Dempsey. Hieroglyphs, as a symbolic means of expressing philosophical ideas, became very widespread in the 16th century, as shown by two related literary genres, which appeared in those times, the emblematic literature and the imprese. For lack of time, I can't dwell on this any longer, but captions from the emblemata of Alcia, who was the inventor of the new genre, from the symbolic questions of Bochy, from the imprese of Capaccio and Simeone, where he suffices to give a general overview of the semantic extension of the concept of hieroglyph. I've also put on the screen a page from Geoffrey Torrey's influential book, Champ Fleury, which is an attempt at, at rationalizing the form and proportions of letters for the printing. When discussing the letter epsilon, Torrey draws a hieroglyphic composition of the letter, showing its symbolic and philosophical properties according to Pythagorean principles. When discussing the emblems, Alcia made this very general remark. Here, he said, emblems are nothing else than that some ingenious paintings invented by spiritual men, similar to the Egyptian hieroglyphic letters, which contain the secrets of those ancient wisdom by means of some motto and sacred portraits. From this doctrine, they didn't allow that the mysteries be based on only to those who had the capacity of understanding them, and not without good reasons, they excluded the vulgar layman. Hieroglyphs were at the time closely connected to emblems, mottos, and heraldic, as shown by a treaty written by Pierre Langlois in 1583. By the 17th century, this was no longer the case, except from, for some esoteric circles, as evident by the famous Mutus Liber, or silent book, that was published in La Rochelle in 1677, but also in the Monas Agroglyphica of John Dean, composed in Yes, composed in 1564, the most obscure book even written by an Englishman, according to Francis Yates, and whose influence lasted for two centuries in the alchemical circles. And this will end the first part of this lecture. I will give the floor to Dimitri. Thank you very much, Jean. So, it's my pleasure to present you the second chapter of this lecture about neo hieroglyphs in the Prince Bishopric of Liège during the Renaissance, with a special focus on the figure of Lambert Lombard and his interest for Egyptiaca. So, probably most of you don't know about uh, this man called or named Lambert Lombard. He was actually a very important agent in the diffusion and promotion of Renaissance arts and ideas in the Low Countries, and especially in the French speaking part of the Low Countries. And his cultural role in this respect was acknowledged so that he appeared on banknotes before the introduction of euros, so in Belgian francs, and more recently on national mailing stamps uh, for his paintings. Lambert Lombard was born in 1505 or 1506, there's uncertainty about this, and passed away more or less at 60 in 1566. He was a student or he was trained by the famous Jan Gossart, uh, one of the first Flemish painters of Yamingi to travel to Rome in 1508-1509 in the time of Pope Julius II. So also in the time of the famous painters Raphael that you all know and Michelangelo, of course. And uh, Jan Gossart was one of the introducers of Italian Renaissance in the Low Countries. Lambert Lombard was one of his students and later on he trained generations uh, of artists in the Low Countries uh, in the Manierism era and even uh, to the beginning of the Baroque period at the turn between the 16th and the 17th century and these are some uh, representatives of those uh, artistic movements. <clears throat> 
As we're going to see, uh, Lambert Lombard also did travel to Rome almost three decades later after Jan Gossart, and he's probably the most famous painter of the Renaissance era and style in the French-speaking part of Belgium, um, and more precisely in the Prince Bishopric of uh, Liège, as a, a key player in the so-called Romanism or diffusion of the Roman Renaissance style in the north of the Low Countries. He was a rather prolific painter, although most of his oeuvre has now vanished, notably in the fire of the residence of a later Prince Bishop of Liège, and maybe even more prolific drawer. We have hundreds, literally hundreds of his drawings, uh, drawings from his workshop actually for himself and for his workshop or team. Uh, he has also a very abundant production of engravings made by others out of his drawings and or his paintings also. In addition to this, uh, to being the main painter of the Prince Bishop of Liège for uh, a few decades in the middle of the 16th century, he's, he's also known to have been an architect and his name was given to the main architectural institute or school in Liège for a very long time for churches as well as for private palaces as you can see on the screen. And he involved himself also in many artistic productions such as funerary monument design as this drawing from the Fritz Lucht collection in Paris in the Netherlands. Netherlands Institute reminds us. Um, so clearly he was a typical Renaissance multi-talented and multifaceted artist, but in the lower countries, no, no, not in Italy, active in various artistic medias. And like important artists of his time, uh, he had his hagiography written by one of his former trainees, Dominicus Lamsonius, or assistant who uh, was eager to demonstrate that Lam Lambert Lombard was a doctus pictor, which means a, a scholar painter. Lambert Lombard was lucky enough to start his career uh, at the time when the Prince, Prince Bishopric of Liège was very powerful, maybe at the peak of his autonomous history during the reign of uh, Erard de Lamarck. Erard de Lamarck was Prince Bishop of Liège from 1506 to his death in 1538. He was also Bishop of Chartres. In, in, in France and Archbishop of the prosperous city of Valencia, uh, which means that he was a very, very wealthy person uh, who was also nominated Cardinal in, the, in 1520. He reconstructed the Prince Bishop's palace ruined by the wars with Burgundy during the previous century and restored and expanded many significant monuments and churches in Liège. His reign is usually considered as the most flourishing of the Prince Bishopric of Liège. Just to give you some ideas about his power, he was protected by the Pope, of course, uh, his elector, but also by the King of France, Louis XII, thanks to his friendship with the Cardinal Georges of Amboise, who was uh, a brother in arms uh, of Erard de Lamarck when they fought in the Italian wars or the French wars in Italy. And he later managed also to ally with the emperor, so the enemies of the French uh, kingdom. And he kept uh, uh, those alliances uh, throughout his reign. So uh, he managed to, to have the Prince Bishopric of Liège as a very uh, powerful uh, uh, zone uh, in, in the European uh, chess game uh, of politics. And he was, as I just said, uh, very powerful. So powerful that when the Cardinal uh, Paul fled England to escape from Henry VIII's vengeance because Cardinal Paul condemned the king's matrimonial and religious policy. You all know the story, of course. Paul went to Liège to search for the protection of Erard de Lamarck, and he was obviously uh, uh, very wise in, in this uh, 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 idea. Uh, so, uh, Paul uh, found refuge uh, uh, in, in Liège, and um, Erard de Lamarck uh, sent him to Rome and asked him to be accompanied by his main painter at that time, which is Aoul Lambert Lombard. So Aoul Lambert Lombard uh, um, had the chance to go uh, within a cardinal uh, uh, expedition to Rome. So he was able there to meet uh, most important and prominent uh, artists like the, the sculptor Baccio Bandinelli or Francesco Salviati for the painters. He was also introduced or he had access to the, the private apartments of the Pope in the Vatican, such as the famous Raphael Stanze or rooms, including uh, Egyptian-like creations like those Telamon figures 
uh, derived from the statues found in the Villa Adriana. And of course, he was admitted also uh, uh, in prestigious antiquities collections of cardinals' residences in Rome, uh, where he could copy some monuments, and we have some drawings of this part of his, of his career. And also, he was supposed to buy some antiquities for the Prince Bishopric of, of Liège. Unfortunately for him, on the 27th of February of 1538, so during the winter when he was there, only three months, Erard de la Marque passed away and he was asked to come back to Liège. And uh, all the collection that he gathered was sold to the Medicis. Um, and then he came back to Liège for almost three decades where, where he had a very prolific career that made him rather famous in the context of the Northern European Renaissance. So this is about who he was uh, uh, in the Renaissance time. Lambert Lombard uh, uh, can be characterized uh, by the fact that he had a, a very special and deep and wide interest in Egyptiaca in Egyptian uh, and Egyptianizing uh, monuments. So like many other painters or artists of the Renaissance, as, as Jean just mentioned, uh, he painted subjects connected to antiquity, antiquity in a style visually suggesting antiquity or what was called at the time Alantica. And in many of those painted landscapes, you can find some Egyptian or Egyptian-like monuments, like here, a pyramid. And often it's possible to connect those pyramids with specific monuments, like this one. It's a pyramid that was beheaded on, on its top, as you can see here. And it can be connected with a second pyramid, so it's not the, par the famous pyramid of Caius Cestius that is well known nowadays in the landscape of Rome, but it's a pyramid that was in the area of the Vatican uh, uh, that was destroyed in the, the first half of the 16th uh, century. Another example of this is this obeliscus, uh, obelisk in, in the, uh, another painting of Lambert Lombard. And you can see from the, the setting device to, to set up uh, uh, the, the obelisk that it was directly derived from uh, uh, Egyptian uh, monuments in the Roman landscape. So it's possible to trace the sources of inspiration. Of course, with that kind of uh, uh, reference to ancient Egyptian uh, objects or Egyptianizing object, Egyptiaca, uh, it's not possible to be sure that he was uh, aware of what he was doing. Maybe he was referring to this because uh, those objects were part of the archaeological landscape of Rome at its time. But uh, as we're going to see, he was much uh, uh, more aware than one could uh, suspect uh, in his interest for uh, ancient Egyptian uh, object. Let me just uh, uh, mention here uh, two examples uh, derived from uh, his graphic production that illustrates very well Lambert Zombard's exceptional interest for Egyptian antiquity. This is a drawing that refers, that, that represents a thematic reference to Egyptian antiquity. It's uh, accompanied by some inscriptions referring to Eusebius of Caesarea and uh, the so-called Book 11 uh, of Eusebius of Caesarea uh, on church history. Actually, this 11th book was written by Rufinus of Aquileia. It's an addition to Eusebius' uh, work, and it's a reference to a god uh, called Canopus, uh, which is actually, we now know this from an Egyptological point of view, it's a reference to Osiris Canopus, which means Osiris of Canopos, which was a form of Osiris Udreus uh, in uh, Greek uh, uh, text, so Osiris connected with water. What is interesting, it was studied by uh, Erwin Panofsky, is the history of the rediscovery of this motif. And during the, uh, the uh, 16th century, uh, it was uh, perceived as a god of water and connected with uh, the Roman god Neptunus. And it's only uh, after the, the death of uh, Lambert Lombard that he was depicted as a hold uh, um, uh, or drilled uh, uh, vase with a human head, as you can see on the drawing of Lambert Lombard. So Lambert Lombard was by far the first to depict the god as it is described in the text of Rufinus, that is a dripping vase with a human head. Uh, this is very important because during the 16th century, the so-called Canopus god was perceived as a, a form of Neptunus, as I just said. How did he get into contact with this text? It's most probably with uh, uh, through uh, uh, Reginald Paul, because uh, uh, Paul was um, uh, a fan of Eusebius' uh, books, 
And Zebius was one of his favorite authors. And we know from uh, his secretary that every uh, evening they used to read some extract from the books of Eusebius. And this very passage referring to the, the god Canopus uh, makes some references also to ancient Egyptian sacred letters that is uh, about uh, hieroglyphs. Uh, the, the study of this drawing led me to conclude that it was probably made in the framework of a project of Lambert Lombard's friend, the scholar Abraham Ortelius, to whom the Vita Lombardi was dedicated and who was also very much interested in hieroglyphs, as is shown by his medal that you can see on the right hand side, lower part of the screen, uh, with a hieroglyphic allusion to his personal motto. What is quite striking with this drawing is a supposedly Egypt, of a supposedly Egyptian god and which can only be found on this depiction of this deity during the entire early modern time uh, is the etiphalic aspect of the god. More than a body allusion, this is a very important this is a very important detail in this context because at that time Osiris was perceived by Renaissance scholars as a god of fertility assimilated with the Roman Priapus because of the posthumous begetting of Horus in the myth of Osiris, as it is recalled by Plutarchus. So there might be more Egyptological knowledge in this drawing than one could suspect at first sight. It seems that Lambert Lombard understood somehow that Canopus was a form of Osiris, otherwise this noticeable detail would be difficult to understand. So Osiris Canopus as Osiris Adrius. Let's focus on another drawing from the prolific production, graphic production of Lambert Lombard. Here, some uh, uh, Telamon figures a l'antica. And this one is, of course, of special interest for Egyptologists. As you can see, it's a depiction of the goddess Sekhmet. It's quite easy to connect it with the only standing statue of Sekhmet that was known at that time, a statue that is now kept in uh, the Villa Albani Tornoria in Rome, in this museum. And we know that it was restored in the 18th century, so uh, you, you can see the shape of the original uh, uh, monument. It was formerly in the collection of the Cardinal Cesi in Rome, a collection that for sure, we know this for sure, Lambert Lombard did visit. Uh, it was not the only one, and uh, you can see, for example, uh, among other uh, more classical statues, this statue of Sachmet, as it was copied by Martin van Emskerk, one of the co or uh, contemporaries uh, of uh, Lambert Lombard, also in Rome uh, at the same time. Here you can see it. What is really striking uh, when you, one considers the, the, the drawing of Lambert Lombard is that it, he did not just copy the object in its archaeological state, he graphically restored it. But he did not restore it as a Roman uh, uh, object like Piero Ligorio did in the middle of, of the screen. He restored it as an Egyptian object or an Egyptianizing object in an Egyptianizing style. He added on the, on the head of, or he understood the, the headdress of of the goddess Sekhmet as an MS, and he had it on her hips, a shenjit loincloth. Of course, from an Egyptological point of view, this is a mistake. Uh, uh, it was probably inspired by the Telamon Antinous found in the uh, uh, Villa Adriana, copied by uh, Raphael and his uh, uh, workshop. But it's very interesting because it shows that Lambert Lombard was capable of recognizing those iconographic elements as Egyptian in order to restore uh, in his drawing the statue of Sekhmet, also identified as an, as an Egyptian uh, deity. So he had a very careful look at the object themselves and this very careful look at objects for themselves in the uh, uh, materiality is typical of the 16th century with what one may call the archaeological turn. You know about the linguistic turn, you know about the iconic turn. There's also an archaeological turn, uh, so a switch from text to monuments in order to reconstruct ancient uh, history in the 16th century. And uh, uh, obviously uh, Lambert Lombard took his place in this movement as an antiquarian artist paying much attention to the materiality of those objects and providing the scholarly world of this time with images putting Egyptian realities into images. And uh, uh, this is an illustration of the interest for, for uh, uh, proper uh, or correct uh, um, copies of Egyptian uh, inscriptions on Roman monument that only appeared in the 16th century. And this provides me with a very nice transition uh, about uh, the hieroglyphs of uh, Lambert Lombard. <laughs> 
So uh, Lambert Lombard uh, uh, oeuvre is sparkled with uh, a lot of references to Egyptian hieroglyphs. You have here uh, uh, an example of this, probably one of the earliest in his career, with uh, uh, a scene uh, uh, about the life of St. Paul uh, showing uh, uh, an altar for a god, which is empty, it's for the unknown god, but actually his finger is pointing to a group of uh, signs that are hieroglyphs. Of course, as Jean just uh, mentioned or stressed, these are not Egyptian hieroglyphs. They have another uh, uh, shape, so these are not Egyptian hieroglyphs, but those uh, reinvented uh, hieroglyphs of the Renaissance, so-called neo-hieroglyphs. They are quite numerous in the graphic production of Lambert Lombard, as you can see here, with a drawing from the British Museum, in, uh, from the life uh, depicting an element, uh, uh, an episode in the life of, the, of Jesus, another one here, uh, in the Rijks Museum uh, in Amsterdam. Or another one here from a, a, a drawing from uh, a, a painting, uh, a drawing of uh, Lambert Lombard that was uh, transcribed into engravings uh, by Jérôme Koch. Another one here. So it's the same principles that are used with a panel, a monumental panel with some hieroglyphs, and you have a, a, a gesture that indicates uh, uh, where to look at uh, for, for the beholder. These are also attested, uh, those panels with hieroglyphs in paintings, like here in the rejection of Joachim's offering. So again, it's connected with the, the life and use or pre-use and pre-life of Jesus or here uh, in the circle of the, the, the famous wives, uh, famous ladies in, in antiquity with Rebecca and Elysia at the well. And when you look at the well, you see that there is also a hieroglyphic panel. So we have a lot of those hieroglyphic panels and obviously they refer to the, the book Jean uh, mentioned earlier in this lecture, the book of Francesco Colonna, uh, Hypnerotomachia Polyphili, especially in the Carver's uh, uh, edition. One may, of course, wonder, just like for the landscape with Egyptian or Egyptianizing uh, uh, object, uh, whether those panels, those monumental panels, were hinting at hieroglyphs as a phenomenon, or were they meant to be read as a real inscription? We actually have some clues to answer this question, because in the so many drawings of Lambert Lombard, there are some drawings with the translation of those compositions, as you can see here. So I just mentioned two here, like here, you have the translation. Uh, please note that it's written not in French, it's not in Dutch, it's written in uh, Italian, a language that we know from the hagiographer of Lambert Lombard that he didn't, it was not at ease with this language. He could understand, as uh, Lampsonius wrote, he could understand Italian and Latin in uh, the, the sense that it was close to French. So he, he always regretted throughout his life that he was never trained in Latin or Italian. It's very interesting that he is using Italian to translate uh, uh, his hieroglyphic compositions. And of course, with those translations, we can trace down uh, his sources, which are Colonna and Valeriano uh, that uh, Jean referred to earlier in this lecture also. Here, uh, a model law with a, a finished composition. When we look at the use of uh, Lamb, so we know that he was using them uh, uh, willingly and uh, consciously, knowing that he was creating some inscriptions. When we know this, we can go back to his oeuvre and uh, uh, recognize that uh, he had a thematically very coherent and consistent use. So, for example, here it's reference to God with the eye, the, the solar uh, uh, disk, and the lion, which means God is great and uh, eternal. And you can find the same kind of compositions on other productions of Lambert Lombard, like here on this engraving. Uh, here uh, in the, the episode of the Vestal Claudia towing the ship bearing the statue of Cybele, uh, it's an episode of Roman history where she has to uh, show that she was still virgin as a Vestal and to show that she was devoted to God. And you have some inscriptions that are an extract from the, the text that Jean was also referring to, which uh, suggests you to devote yourself to God and so God will protect yourself. So it's thematically very consistent and coherent with the theme depicted. And uh, most of those uh, uh, evocations are connected with the life uh, 
of the Christ. And we know that uh, from Marcilio Ficino, also referred to earlier, uh, that hieroglyphs uh, were perceived as a sacred script encoding a priscia theologia, as Marcilio Ficino said, that foretold the Christian revelation. So it's very meaningful to put them in the evocation, the graphic evocation of the life of Christ. Uh, in terms of sources, uh, he derives his hieroglyphs from Colonna, but also from Piero Valeriano. As Jean referred to this, the book of Piero Valeriano was published quite late in the 16th century, uh, two years, uh, uh, um, no, uh, 10 years before uh, the death of uh, Lambert Lombard. But we know that the text circulated earlier, especially in Rome, uh, where uh, uh, Valeriano was precisely in 1537 when Paul arrived in, in Rome and also in at the court of the Pope uh, Lambert Lombard. So it seems that uh, from those objects that uh, Lambert Lombard was perceived as some sort of a specialist in hieroglyphs in Liège in the 16th century, capable of writing some mottos or some devices, some sentences in hieroglyphs, just like Albert Cicci that uh, Jean mentioned earlier. And one should uh, uh, quote here uh, uh, an extract from uh, the Vita Lombardi by Dominicus Lamsonius, where he said that uh, Lambert Lombard bought statues, gems, and gravestones, and all other ancient works of art with an astonishing avidity. He especially bought ancient coins whose inscriptions he read and whose hieroglyphs he interpreted with such an ease and erudition that he was second to no scholar specialized in ancient languages and history. And in the Latin text, it's written hieroglyphica. And in this context, it must be uh, uh, reminded uh, that Lambert Lombard was also the, the professor, let's say, of Hubert Goltius, who was recognized as the father of numis numismatic science in Belgium. So taking this into account and the fact that uh, Lambert Lombard for sure made some funerary monument design, uh, I leave the floor for the, for the conclusion of our lecture to Jean about the monument of the Chanoine Hubert Millemans. Yeah, thank you, Dimitris. I come back from the last part of this lecture uh, with focus on Hubert Millemans. So Hubert Millemans was an important officer in the service of Prince Bishop Georg of Austria, who died in 1557, a year before Millemans. He was in charge of collecting taxes and was dealing with the state finances. He was thus probably very wealthy and well connected to the members of the elite. In his will, he mentioned that it had already provided for a large block of black marble to be brought to the Holy Cross Church where he intended to be buried. He passed away in 1558, and his funerary monument was probably realized shortly after his death. What interested us here is the lower part of the monument. On both sides of the Latin inscription that stand in the center are two columns of neo hieroglyphs. Different atoms have already been made to translate the text. It's indeed beyond any doubt that there was an underlying text, probably in Latin, that provided the basis for the inscription. But unlike Corona's polyphily or Alberici's treatise, where the interpretation of the neo hieroglyph is given, the model hasn't yet surfaced. When compared to other neo hieroglyphic compositions that were only indexical to a certain image of Egypt, as was the case in some paintings of Lambert Lombard or of Mantegna, who was before Colonna's first edition, there is every indication that the neo hieroglyphs on the monument of Millemans were conceived as writing signs. The signs are indeed calibrated, stylized, and arranged to form sentences. The fact that some signs are repeated is also a good indication of the author's intention. But there is more. Some signs replicate exactly a group that is first attested in Colonna. A comparison between the two editions of the Polyphilus, that of Aldo Manucci printed in Venice, that is the first original edition of 1499, and that of Carver in Paris of 1543, reveals that those who were responsible for the inscription of Millemans were dependent to the French edition. 
Different attempts have been made to translate Milleman's inscription. The first one was proposed by Louis de Roy in 1946. De Roy was convinced that one had to discover the Latin words that were used to name the different items present on the inscription. Then by selecting the first part of the Latin word, that is by using the principle of acrophony, one would form meaningful sentences. This was rightly criticized by the Tervaro one year later. Tervaro pointed to the right direction by linking Milleman's inscription to Colonna's novel. Tervaro's translation undoubtedly made a step forward, but he wasn't aware of all the connections that could be made with all the production of neo hieroglyphs in the Renaissance, not the Rumerus theoretical treatises dealing with a symbolic way of representing ideas. The study by Frekin, which was published much later in 2005, builds upon Tervaron's analysis without adding very much. In the following slide, the two following slides, I summarize the parallels that can be made. Colonna's polyphily is an obvious source but very far from being the unique one. Parallels can be found in the royal manuscripts of Alberici, which doesn't mean, of course, that it was known in Liège, but more simply, that this type of repertoire circulated widely in Europe. Interesting points for comparison are found in Rapolo's French edition by Kerber, in Valeriano's Eoglyphica, Alcia's Emblemata, but also in drawings made by Lambert Lambert. The dog, which appears on the second column, is unknown in parallel sources, in Italian sources, sorry, but present, for instance, of the magnificent triumph arch for Maximilian designed by Dürer. Dürer also drew for his friend Perkheimer some illustrations for an edition of Rapolo, which were never published. The drawings are preserved on a manuscript now in Vienna. Among them is a composition for illustrating how the Egyptians represented the horoscopus. It's a Rapolo notice number 42, with a man eating a whole glass, which is also present on the second column and unknown by Colonna. I now come to my translation. Considering that it's a funerary monument, I suppose that the underlying text was composed in Latin, which is important for the syntax, for the place of the words is more flexible than in French. And thus I propose the following translation for the left column. Mortivita semper subjecta, rapientis consumenti truncanti omnium fortunam or maybe fatum. So in a more common language now, life is always subjected to death which steals, consumes, and cuts the destiny of all. The last part of the left inscription with the knife and the distaff is directly linked to, the, to a sketch made by Lombard, uh, the, the, one of the sketch Dimitri already alluded to. The composition which is preserved in the so-called album Arenberg is translated by Lombard, Breve e veloci e la vita dei grandi, which means short and quick, in the life of the great ones. The sentence is reminiscent of the motto Memento Mori, Remember to Die, which is also indirectly present on Milleman's monument with a short Greek inscription, Apoblepe Telos, Consider the End. One can also note that on the left on this column, there is a medallion with a skull and a bone. The first inscription has thus a thematic unity, very much in the spirit of what can be expected on a funeral monument. For the white column, my interpretation is as follows. Lumina mundum, custodia et labore vitam guberna liberaliter prudenterque per horas morti contraria. In English, be a light to the world, by safekeeping and by labor, govern your life liberally, which is the opposite of death, with nobility and foresight, or by Howard. This text is a vivid appeal to behalf righteously, which is a natural complement 
to the darker statement about death in the previous column. The living beings are encouraged to behave well, which is a way of fighting against death by the memory that will be left of us to the posterity. And this is, by the way, an attitude which is, which is not without parallels in the Egyptian wisdom text. Appeal to a dignified attitude is also found on one day hieroglyphic inscription of Colonas Polyphili, Firmam custodiam vitae tuae misericorditer gubernando tenebit in columnem queservabit, and in one of the compositions made by Alberici, where the conduct in life is compared to a ship at prudenter te in mundo gubernes, and govern yourself with prudence in the world. And we know at the end of our journey, after the Renaissance, the production of text in neo hieroglyphs became old-fashioned and outmoded. The spirit of the Renaissance, however, remained well in life in the 17th century. Father Athanasius Kircher, indeed, kept the symbolic approach of his predecessor, but applied it to real hieroglyphic inscriptions like the obelisks that were re-erected in Rome. He also aided to his quest a theological dimension, being persuaded that the inscription carved in the obelisk had preserved meaningful traces on the true face. And this is the principle of the Prisca uh, Theologia Dimitri also alluded to uh, earlier in this lecture. But this is another story. And with this, we, both of us, thank you for your attention. Thank you.